I'm going to trip over everything and fight you all at the end of this. <laughs> <clears throat> By now, it's a little bit redundant for me to say that everyday life is moving online rapidly. Private software companies that collect mass amounts of data on citizens through our use of smartphones and wearable technologies are increasingly using that data to move into service areas that have traditionally been government monopolies. Meanwhile, Bitcoin and the revolutionary blockchain technology that powers it are moving finance in a direction that some say will threaten the state's ability to control the currency. States are being forced to innovate or to become irrelevant. So what are states doing to innovate? Estonia, of all places, recently offered free e-citizenship to anyone living anywhere in the world who wants it. You could become a resident of Estonia. Meanwhile, countries like Sweden are advocating for legislative changes that would allow them to offer their own welfare services to citizens in surrounding states, as well as their own. Tim O'Reilly has said, government is becoming a platform. However, whereas he lamented that the state is not subject to the same creative destruction that disciplines private firms and creates innovation, I say we are facing a competitive market for citizenship fueled by mobile e-services available from anywhere in the world. In a competitive market for citizenship, Canada will face competition not only from other established states, but from new players that emerge online. In this context, citizen engagement becomes the new international arena in which we must compete. For Canada, there is much work to be done. Previous attempts at citizen engagement online have consistently demonstrated low quality input from citizens that is not usable as policy advice. This threatens the entire citizen engagement exercise and in turn threatens government's attempts to bolster its own declining appeal through these engagements. The widespread failure of these attempts necessitates government looking for new theories of engagement and online experiential design that is more social, dynamic, and incentivized. Now, as it turns out, a good place to look for new theories of engagement and online design, as crazy as it sounds, is the world of massively multiplayer online games. Still, you're still in this? Okay. These games already boast productive collaborative economies with hundreds of thousands of users, sometimes millions, as in the case of World of Warcraft. What's more, the virtual economies within these games have already started to bleed into the real economy with players paying for virtual goods within, um, where would you find virtual goods? Within the game with real money. Or paying for real goods outside of the game with virtual currencies generated within it. I'm just gonna get a bit of water. A serious field of economic study has already sprung up, led by people like Vili Lidonverda and Edward Castronova, co-authors of the book Virtual Economies, Analysis and Design. But first, let me ease you in with a little bit of what we've learned about online participation outside of the world of games. Research has shown that online participants generally prefer activities that communicate something about themselves to other users, rather than simply seek to influence government decision makers. 
When faced with this finding, the authors of this study hypothesized a new form of polity that took its incentive from its own performance rather than, again, trying to influence government decision makers. The importance of this social signaling to other users will make the next finding more intuitive. Another study did find that an explicit monetary reward did have a short-term effect positively on both active and passive users in encouraging their online participation. Active users are those who actively contribute content to a site. Passive users are those who simply browse the content of others. However, this explicit monetary reward had a negative effect on active users' online participation in the long term. There was a crowding out effect where the explicit monetary incentive negated more important to the user implicit incentives like perceived altruism or reputation. Online user participation is dynamic and changes based on previous user experiences. Let me tell you a little bit about a peer-to-peer -peer microfinance site and a study of dynamic lending behaviors on that site. Just quickly, this was a site that lent money to people with no credit history from disadvantaged backgrounds. The study found that new lenders relied on what we call collective intelligence, or the wisdom of the crowd, using online tools that allowed them to collectively vote on their perceptions of the trustworthiness of the borrower. However, the study also found that as lenders accumulated more experience, they switched from collective intelligence to their own accumulated expertise. So I think you're starting to see how an online, social, dynamic experience can improve performance. But first, let me offer you a brief aside that nonetheless demonstrates the complexity of concerns that need to be addressed in online design. Gender analysis. An analysis of online responses between males and females in online environments. Now first, this is relative to the studies I told you about. But this study found that females, more than males, responded to social or team-based incentives, whereas males responded more to individualistic, uh, profit-based incentives. What's more, there seemed to be an out-group favoritism among males and an in-group favoritism among females, meaning that males were more likely to collaborate in a non-team-based setting than in a team-based one. Hold on, this, this last one is also pretty weird. There was a significant gendered effect in online responses to automated non-human agents. Females more than males, even after being told that they were dealing with a non-human automated agent, were more likely in their responses to treat that agent as if it was human. Now, in the studies I've described, the benefits of social incentive mechanisms are merely felt or implicit. It can be extremely powerful to locate these benefits in a virtual good. Online encapsulations of the earned reputation of the user. The user can then enjoy these virtual goods herself, use them to signal to other users, or in some cases, trade them for real-world goods, like money or prizes, if that's your thing. Online incentives have reached their most sophisticated extent in the world of massively multiplayer online games. However, Real economies and virtual economies differ in ways that we have to understand if we're going to harness these incentives for citizen engagement. 
Scarcity, for example, is very important to both virtual and traditional economies. In the real world, many goods are attributed their value through their relative scarcity. Diamonds and precious gems are a good example of this. Digital goods cannot be scarce in this way. As Leda has, Leighton Verda has said in another paper, everybody in the game could technically have the best suit of armor and a castle by the lake. However, that's not very fun because you've removed the challenge of acquiring these goods for yourself and the satisfaction of signaling to other users your accomplishments through these goods. The real world gives us a set of parameters that structures competition and creates incentives. Online, we have to design these parameters and create these incentives. And since, while we're stuck in this real world, there are multiple online worlds to choose from, we have to do a good job of our design. Transaction costs are another interesting example. A real firm will seek to reduce its transaction costs to as little as possible. The less you spend on transporting your goods, the higher your profits. Online, we could easily collapse the dimensions of time and space to nothing, allowing for instant transactions. We could equally reduce information costs to the user to zero, providing all the information they need up front for free. That's not a game. You gotta go back, put in the drama. The act of moving your avatar to a particular place at a particular time to trade with other users is part of the experience. It's part of the fun of the game. Interacting with other users to discover new information, information that some other users might not have yet, prestige information is also part of the fun. In fact, medieval guild structures that to some extent limit trade are more popular in online games than free markets. Virtual economics offers us the prospect of a dramatic leap forward in citizen engagement. If we can learn to structure our policy questions, our uh, open data, co-creation of services within online environments that are more social, dynamic, and incentivized, we can strengthen engagement and democratic legitimacy. But hold on. Let me offer one brief caution. The advent of online worlds, designable down to the last detail, necessitates the most complete knowledge and use of the tools possible. However, we must also interrogate the values that underpin our usage of these tools. Thaler and Sunstein, authors of the popular book Nudge on behavioral economics, have described their own goal this way. To see if life can be made easier and safer for the homers among us and the homers within each of us. If people can rely on their automatic systems without getting into terrible trouble, their lives can be easier better and longer. The Homer they're describing is Homer Simpson, an example of the non-deliberative, distracted life left on autopilot. Is that what we want? Writer Susan Delacourt has pointed out the difference between giving citizens what they want and what they need. Now, I would hope that we don't use virtual economics to make life easier, but that we use it to make life more of a challenge. A challenge that wakes people up. A challenge that engages them with the decisions that affect their lives. A challenge that inspires them to be Canadians. Thanks, that's it. Thanks.